There's a pretty one, Ulysses. I'm Sean the Book Mania. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with a library book haul, a university library book haul. I've never done one of these. I may never do one again, but I'm gonna try it. I spend 99% of the time, my time, now that I'm living in Saskatoon, this first six or eight months or however long it is, at home. But when I do go out on my own, I usually venture out to the branch library down the street or the bus goes right from my door to the University of Saskatchewan Library where I as if you've been following along, you know I got an alumni card and I've been using the both libraries a lot. So I was at the University of Saskatchewan Library the other day, Thursday. It's now Saturday night. And uh, yeah, I'm going to show you what I brought home. The first one is a book that I took back because I had renewed it three times. So I had it out for three months already and I was no longer able to renew it online. I had to take it back, hand it to them. And as long as nobody else wanted it, I could renew it again and start the six month cycle or the three month cycle all over again. Queen Mary and Others by Osbert Sitwell. <laughs> it's a bare hardback, so there's not much to see, but there, there is Osbert. Osbert Sitwell is from this famous Sitwell family. His sister was Edith. She's probably the, the most famous. And I think he's got a Sat Satchel and another brother. And I think they were all queer. Certainly Osbert was. <laughs> and I have to tell you, I, I got this book out because I remember hearing about it in one of the two or three biographies of Queen Mary that I've read. And I think uh, that he was quoted a lot in those biographies. That when I checked and saw that they had this collection of his essays entitled Queen Mary and, Other, and Others, I signed it out. And I have read the entire 40-page essay out loud to my... Similarly, Queen Mary obsessed buddy reader friend Leah in Calgary, and I freaking peed my pants reading most of it to her. It's so funny. You don't have to really, well, you have to know a little bit about how staid and kind of boring and um, uh, upright a person Queen Mary was that to really get to the humor. But once you, you really, if you can visualize those adjectives put to a person, a royal personage, I, I would challenge any of you to keep a straight face about the hilarious stories that he tells about Queen Mary. Um, I'll just give you one tiny one. It's not the funniest, but just to give you a little taste. He talks about when she and her husband, when they were still the Prince and Princess of Wales, they did a Canadian tour and she was in the, and they just checked into a hotel, I believe it was in Montreal. And one of the hotel staff came in and started ordering her around thinking that she was the, the maid, the royal maid. <laughs> no, it's Princess Mary. <laughs> There's so many like that. There's, and that just, I was in stitches, as they say. So I, uh, all I managed to do was read that first essay to Leah, and I'm gonna read the rest of the essays and see if they, what they're all about. Osbert Sitwell, his dates are 1892 to 1969. Yeah, there was the two siblings, two other siblings, Edith Sitwell and Sacheverell, I forget how to pronounce the other brother's name. And he lived a very, he was a, a baronet, a genealogist and an antiquarian. <laughs> Never married, wrote poetry. He was quite a friend of the royal family, um, was in, into politics. And he wrote poetry, art criticism and controversial journalism. He has written some fiction and I, of course, since he died in 1969, it's copyright is off, but I can't find a short story that's under about 40 pages and that's just too long to read for my story seekers tier level for Patreon. But maybe if I like one of these shorter essays, uh, I'll read that. He got Parkinson's in the 1950s and by the, by the mid 60s, he was really debilitated by that and his ending, the end of his life was quite sad. But uh, boy, the stories he tells about Queen Mary were just delicious. Here are the books that I signed out fresh. I took out, I think it's a volume one, isn't it? No, it's not volume one. A collection of short stories from 1961. It's called Hear Us, O Lord, From Heaven Thy Dwelling Place, which is a horrifically religious title. I think it sounds like the name of a, a title of a hymn or something. 
by Malcolm Lowry, who was a British writer. I believe he lived in Canada for a certain amount of time, didn't he? Yeah, he went with his first wife to New York City. He was psychiatrically hospitalized there. Then 19... Uh, went to Mexico in the, this we're looking at the late 30s, and then in the late, also in the late 30s, he moved to Vancouver. And his um, ramshackle ca cabin that he was living in burnt down in 1944. It was badly burned trying to save his manuscript unsuccessfully. Good Lord. Then uh, they traveled. I'm not sure if he stayed with that same partner. I don't know, but to Europe, America, and the Caribbean. He lived in Canada for much of his active writing career. So he was also considered part of Canadian literature. Anyway, this sentence just jumped out at me from his Wikipedia page. He was at Cambridge, 1929. During the first term, his roommate, Paul Fitt or Fitta, wanted to be in a gay homosexual relationship with Lowry. Lowry refused. I don't have any information about how, what the tone was of that refusal, but uh, that guy, Paul Fitt or Fitta, killed himself. That death haunted Malcolm Lowry for the rest of his life. So then I would be very interested in reading about how homosexuality is depicted, if at all, in his work. Can anybody enlighten me? I haven't read him. Fascinating. This one is really special because I don't think I ever read this, but I think I signed this very copy of this short story collection by a gay author out of the University of Saskatchewan Library in the, probably the 80s when I was a student there. And I don't, but I don't remember if I ever read it, but I recognized it immediately. I didn't buy it. I know that. So I think I have had this book on my shelf in the past. It is Letters from a Great Uncle and Other Stories by, by Richard Hall. And that's quite a striking cover, which I remember. The collection itself was published in 1985. So that would have been right around the time that I would have been at the university. Richard Hall has come back onto my radar because one of my subscribers, who's also a patron, told me that he's been reading some Richard Hall and really recommended it to me. And it brought back a lot of memories. And I can't, I might have read one or two stories or a different collection. He had three or four collections. Couplings is another one of his famous books. He was also a playwright. Richard Hall's dates are 1926 to 1992, born in New York City, died of AIDS in New York City in 1992, and his uh, longtime lover, Arthur Marceau, predeceased him in 1989. Oh, there's an essay about him in that anthology of writings about gay male writers called The Lost Library, Gay Fiction Rediscovered. I used to, I had that book on my shelf forever and never read it. and don't have it anymore, I don't think, so I'm going to have to get that one back too. My Patreon subscriber, I won't name him, but he really recommended him. He said no pressure, and I didn't take it as pressure, but I looked him up at the library. He read Letter from a Great Uncle, as well as Fidelities and Couplings, all within 2022, and was really impressed. So the opening paragraph of the, of the title story is as follows. The letter was a family tradition. It existed, but no one knew where. When discovered, it would shed light on certain mysteries. Why Uncle Harris spent time in the famous state asylum in Gideon. What scandal lay behind his exile from Texas. Why he passed his life up north among Yankees. All right, that's got my attention. Speaking of gay male literature, this one jumped out at me because of these, this on the spine, which I recognized as being the kind of logo or whatever for gay men's press in the UK. So I pulled it off the shelf sat down at a table with it and looked up more about the book and the author. So it is called Who Lies Inside by Timothy Ireland. And it is a novella, 123 pages or something, from 1984, by, published by Gay Men's Press. And surprisingly, maybe only to me, Timothy Ireland is not Irish. He's, he's English. This is a coming up story, which I love, and I know it's not really trendy to to hold up, valorize, or pay much attention to coming out stories anymore, which I think is absolute bullshit. So when I find another one, I'm, I'm all over it. He never became famous enough to have his own Wikipedia page. I can't find anything more about him, but he did write at least this book. 
and at the time he was living in London, born in Southborough, Kent in 1959. Let's hear the first paragraph of this. I suppose, first of all, I should tell you my name. It's Martin Conway. From the outside, I look just like an ordinary young man, though perhaps I'm a bit taller than most. My friends in the rugby team at school call me Jumbo. It's my nickname. I don't mind it, not really. You might see someone like me on any street in any town, walking along, not too sure of myself, a tall, well-built young man in jumper and jeans. But inside, something's different. Well, I like that. It doesn't matter whether I'm in a library, a bookstore, or somebody's house. I love to browse books, and that's how I find a lot of the, the best ones. So when I'm in the stacks at the, either of the libraries, but today we're talking about the University of Saskatchewan Library, I just look at the spines and, and see which one sparks, not joy, but sparks, I don't know, interest. Plus, I'm always looking for short stories to read on my Patreon account. If you don't know what I'm talking about, about reading short stories on my Patreon account, I don't like to over-promote it, but check out the show notes for more information. I found this one. Cactus Town and Other Stories. And I believe it will be pronounced Amer Hussein. No translator. Published in 2002. He is a Pakistani-born British writer who I had never heard of. So let's look, let's look him up. Born in 1955 in Karachi. Wikipedia calls him a Pakistani critic and short story writer. He moved to London in 1970. As far as I can tell, he's, he's still in London. So a Pakistani British writer. He is very much alive. This is his third collection of short stories. Here is the opening paragraph of the first story in the collection. The title is, What Do You Call Those Birds? And there's actually an epigraph from a Punjabi wedding song as follows. The waters of the ocean are pure, my friend. Remember, love will last but two days, and its pain a lifetime endure. Oh, isn't that optimistic? Here's the opening paragraph. The summer they met, before the storm that brought down branches and set the year apart for Londoners, Iman and Samir, birds of passage both, were the best of friends. Samir was 31, beginning to sell stories and working as an itinerant reviewer of books and films while he researched a thankless thesis contrasting the feminological approaches of Sartre and Klein. Iman, four years younger, was the elegant books editor of a politically orientated current affairs magazine. She commissioned pieces by Samir on a fairly regular basis, but she'd also decided that her real task was to launch him as a burgeoning talent in a world she knew was fickle. Well, that's a pretty interesting start to a story. Tell me if you've heard about Amer Hussein. There's this gorgeous, you know, it's printed on paper that's kind of like the paper you find in the bod in the Bible. It's really thin and it's just that's such a lovely. And I, I borrowed from the Library of America, but with no dust jacket. I think it's the collected works of, of Mary McCarthy. It was a two volume set, and I borrowed the, the volume that's entitled no Novels and Stories, 1942 to 1963. So I'm gonna guess that might have been volume one. The novels are The Company She Keeps, The Oasis, The Groves of Academe, A Charmed Life, and then Stories. And I borrowed it because of the stories because one or two of them were short enough that I could read, but then I looked more carefully at the copyright page. Just because somebody's been dead for 50 years does not mean that their stuff is, the copyright has expired. This collection was published in 2017, and the copyrights of all of her previously published stuff is, hmm, I'm gonna have to look at, her, look at it in much greater detail, but I see that at least some of the short stories are copyright, for example, copyright 1963 by Mary McCarthy, and then published by arrangement with the Mary McCarthy Literary Trust. So I probably have to contact the Mary McCarthy Literary Trust to get permission, but I'll still read one or two of the stories to my own self. At the University of Saskatchewan Library, they have a shelf of new acquisitions that I always peruse, but I've never, I had never before borrowed a book off that. I just felt like I was just gonna keep it for three months and probably not read it, and I should let the student population and the professors, the faculty, have first dibs. But I broke down and borrowed this one 
to play with. I don't know if it's the kind of book that I would read from cover to cover, but boy, is the topic ever interesting. There it is. It is called Native Removal Writing, Narratives of Peoplehood, Politics, and Law by Sabine N. Meyer. Indian removal, it's not a term that's bandied about in Canadian historical, that I'm aware of in Canadian history, or I mean in the history of how Canadians were genocidal towards indigenous people, but it's the 19th century policy of expelling native peoples from their land. Indian removal, and we certainly, like I say, we certainly did that shit in what is now Canada, probably even more than the Americans did. But this is a study of Native American writings across the centuries about Indian removal. And I wasn't aware that there was a literature specifically focused on that. This academic, Sabine Meyer, argues that it's a distinct genre of Native or Indigenous literature. And she, I think it's a she, studies novels and nonfiction writings. It lists a whole bunch of writers, politicians, and scholars, none of whose names are familiar to me, but I thought this was a book that I would just like to page through. I could buy a copy on Amazon for $125, so I'm not about to do that, but goodness, maybe even read cover to cover. Certainly the topic is fascinating, and it's a new release as of 2022. I love the opening paragraph of the introduction, so I'm going to read it to you, even though it's a little long, but it connects her academic research with what's going on today because we're always stealing stuff that belongs to indigenous people it's just what white people do during the summer of 2016 thousands of protesters most of them native americans set up camp in north dakota to protest the dakota access pipeline dapl a 1200 mile conduit to be built by texas-based energy transfer partners to transport as many as 570,000 barrels of crude oil per day from North Dakota to Illinois. Rerouted to travel underneath the Missouri River, the major source of drinking water for the Standing Rock Sioux, the pipeline has sparked resistance among tribal members who fear leakage and the damage of their water supply and who complain that the pipeline traverses sacred burial grounds. At the beginning of December 2016, the hashtag no DAPL protesters achieved a remarkable victory when the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers announced that it would look for alternative routes for the pipeline. In February 2017, however, newly inaugurated, twice impeached, disgraced President Donald Trump, I added a few words there, issued a presidential memorandum directing the U.S. Army Corps to end its search for alternatives. After failed attempts by the Cheyenne River Sioux and the Standing Rock Sioux to secure a restraining order against the pipeline in U.S. District Court, North Dakota state government officials set a deadline for the evacuation of the camp. On February 23, 2017, those unwilling to leave were forcibly removed by the National Guard and law enforcement officers in what one journalist called a military-style takeover. Okay, well that just makes my blood boil. I might have heard a little bit about it, but nothing that stayed in my memory, but that kind of shit has been happening through the centuries, and this is a study of the writing, fiction or non, about that. It sounds so important. I wanna delve further into this book. All right, so that's my university library book haul. What do you think? You gonna read any of these books yourselves? Which ones do you think I should start? Which other ones pique your interest? Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.